Cam, tell us about yourself just briefly for those who may not know where you fit into all of this. Sure. <clears throat> um, morning, everybody. Um, my name's Cam Speedy. I'm a forest ecologist by training, um, university, forest service, department of conservation. But uh, in the last 20 years, I've worked across a whole lot of different places uh, in the pest management space. Uh, I was operations manager for EPRO at Topor, doing a million hectares of pest control every year across um, the nation. Uh, I did project manage the Mangatauteri eradication behind the fence at Mangatauteri, and it's awesome to see Kakapo now back in the southern enclosure there. And yeah, I've just um, been learning and sharing for the last couple of decades in growing the human capital in the predator space because it's people that are going to crack this, not widgets and gadgets. Carefully trained, diligent people are going to be what Predator Free 2050 is all about. Absolutely. All right, everyone, let's get underway. Cam's going to take us through this. Thanks, Nick. So just briefly, um, Predator management in New Zealand is unfortunately about killing things to protect things. Um, so, you know, if we want Tonga like Kereru to survive and thrive in New Zealand, we actually have to do predator control. It's unfortunate for things like rats and possums and stoats. Many of them are beautiful creatures in their own right, but they're the wrong critter in the wrong place. So we have a task to honour the biodiversity of this nation by managing these invasives. So today's all about how we might do that a little bit better. So, um, yeah, we'll rock on. Thanks very much to Predator Free New Zealand for supporting me to bring this stuff. It's, um, it's been really awesome working with Jesse and the team the last few years. Um, I want to just start with a, a little bit about the social element of many of the introduced animals that have been brought to New Zealand. All of these animals on the screen have a consequence. Uh, but the important thing for us to remember is that as citizens, we value them differently. Not many of us would argue that a rat wasn't a pest, or perhaps a, a mustelid wasn't a pest. Uh, people made a lot of money out of possums in the day. Uh, and then when we moved to things like hedgehogs, we all grew up with Beatrice Potter and Mrs. Tiggy Winkle, and there's some quite sort of emotional sort of stuff around hedgehogs, but they're a devastating predator in our environment. Cats, the cat debate is raging in New Zealand pet cats versus feral cats. Um, people have very different views around um, our cats. And then when you come to our kai species like pigs and deer, these are animals that have a consequence, but also have immense social cultural value as, as food on the table. So it's really important that we understand the social dynamic to these animals and that we have some empathy for the wide range of views because our social license as predator managers relies on public acceptability. So we actually have to take that into account. So it's really important that, that we understand different people treat different animals with different attitudes based around their own value judgments and their own perspectives. Um, moving on. New Zealand leads the world in invasive predator problems, but we also lead the world in invasive predator solutions and i'm really proud of that i've been a part of that for my career and all the mentors and experts that have helped me get to the understanding that's reflected in this presentation today have been involved in developing some of these amazing tools but the important thing to remember is that all of these tools have advantages limitations and consequences there is no silver bullet and overused tools get blunt and that's a a cautionary tale for us to to have in the front of our mind that uh, these animals are pests because they adapt and we need to stay ahead of the game and when tools get blunt we need to change them up so um, that means at a strategic level we need to think carefully about what we do and how we do it um, this is an approach i take with all of my predator management it starts with the right strategy to get the outcome you're after and that will lead you to the design that will deliver that, and then you carefully implement your design. Unfortunately, what I see all around the nation is that people jump straight to the implementation, buy some kit, chuck it out there, without really thinking about what are we trying to achieve, what's the best way to achieve that, and then when we do monitor it, uh, sorry, implement it and deliver it, how do we monitor it to make sure we stay on track? So it's really important that we have this strategic approach. You hear a lot around um, 
predator management terms like eradication, sustained control, suppression, um, they all mean different things. Um, I have an analogy for predator control that I call the rubber band analogy, um, which is if you just take a simple rubber band and just hold it in your hand uh, unstretched, that's a do nothing strategy. And we know that do nothing is not an option because we'll lose these treasures that, that are so important to our nation. Once we start doing control, what we're doing is we're stretching the rubber band and that takes energy and effort. Um, that's the suppression regime. The further you stretch the rubber band, the lower the pest numbers get, the harder they push back, but the harder it is to stay um, stretching, the more energy it takes. And you have to hold it there because if you stop for just a minute, the rubber band goes back to where it was and you lose all the gains you've made. With predator-proof fence technology, we've been able to do local elimination behind fences, but often these fence places are only one windstorm or one washout away from a re-invasion. You've got one millimetre of wire between an island of treasures and a sea of pests. So uh, we, we tend to call those places local elimination. Eradication is actually getting rid of everything. And it's not what most of us do in our community groups. Most of us are in the suppression mode. And that's not to say what we do isn't really, really important because while organizations like ZIP and the Next Foundation and um, Predator Free 2050 Limited develop new technologies that'll take us towards eradication, we have to hold the line in our important places for our important treasures. So what we do in the community predator space is sustained control. We're stretching the rubber band and the harder we stretch the rubber band, the more gains we'll make but the harder it becomes and you get tired, your arms get tired. You stretch a big rubber band for 10 minutes and tell me how tired your arms get. That's that's what we're involved with. Um, so it's really important to understand the different terminology. What we do mostly in the community space is suppression. It's really important to hold the line. But with all these tools and stuff we have, the most powerful tool is actually our people and their knowledge of the animals we're trying to control. And I think that's the key message that I'm going to get across to you today is that the most powerful tool we have is knowing our predators really, really well. All these critters listed around this page here have different uh, ecology, different biology. They operate differently in different landscapes. They have different home ranges, breeding rates, dispersal ranges. They're driven by different things. Rats are driven by food, stoats are driven by rats, um, cats and ferrets are often driven by rabbits, which are driven by dry periods where they can thrive. So, you know, all these things are environmental cues that drive these predators. We have to know how each of them uses the habitat at place to get the best out of them. What drives them? I use a, a, a little thing called the four Fs, um, and that is around food, starting a family, um, uh, fear, is, is, a, is a behavior that you really don't want to push and fighting related to all of those. Animals will fight around things like food, around starting a family and, are, and around being fear, the fight or flight. It's those four Fs are what drive all animal behavior. And, and the behaviors that scientists describe, many of these critters on the screen here, is, is this yin and yang dynamic between cautious and inquisitive. The caution is in their favor. That makes them um, avoid what we're trying to do to them. The inquisitive is in our favor. That's what makes us, uh, gives us that chink in their armor that allows us to win the game. You've got issues like dominance and subordinates between males and females, between adults and juveniles, and even between species. You know, when you've got lots of rats, mice are suppressed through functions of um, competition and predation. Um, and, and even between species like uh, possums and wallabies, you know, wallabies are very subordinate creatures that won't feed it at device sites or bait station sites when there's a lot of possums around. So the subordinates to dominant, uh, dominance relationship is really important. What we are in is we're in a battle between our knowledge of predators and their ability to adapt. And we've got to stay ahead of the game at all times if, if we had to win this battle, this behavioral battle. I want to show this little video, but before I ask Nick to do this, I'll just explain what's happening here. These possums have been trained with food rewards to come to the site to engage with this device. Food is an incredibly powerful behavioral manipulation that you can use to your advantage. So uh, if you just put a bait on a device, 
you're not going to get as good a success as if you train the animals that you're actually something or someone that they want to engage with and want to come and check out. So what's happening here is this place has been pre-fed with a product called Smooth Blue from Conovation. It's a cinnamon dough, sweet, oily sort of um, thing. And these animals are being trained to come to the site because we want them to engage with this trap. So if you just play this brief video, Nick, you can hear possums screeching in the background. Um, there is a whole lot of pre-feed being put at this site up at the top of the ramp, but all down the bottom of the ramp and around the trees on the side. The animals are coming here because we've trained them to come here. We want them to come here because we want them to engage with this kill trap. So this is what I'm talking about, modifying the behavior. Okay, back to the uh, slideshow, Nick. So this yellow device on this Kanuka tree in this pine plantation here is called an Envirome 800. It's an automated feeder, and it can be set to deliver pre-feed uh, or toxins if you want, but in this case, it was delivering pre-feed um, every day for seven days or every second day for 14 days in, in this case. Uh, and there's some Steve Allen kill traps placed at the site. And over a period of two weeks, pre-feeding the site has encouraged increasing numbers of possums to come and visit the site. These traps are not set until night 13 or 14. Uh, once the social interactions have been set up at the site, and communicating the food and the social interactions that are here, the, the opportunity for mating, the, so the opportunity to engage. The pad runs that open up to a place like this are like State Highway 1. Um, over a period of days and weeks, these animals queue on to this site. We're training them to do what we need them to do, which is commit suicide at one of these kill traps. So this is the concept of a nightclub a social and food interaction which encourages critters to come and do what you want them to do rather than you working harder and trying to chase them. So um, if we don't do this, I would, I'd really like you to show you this cacophony uh, video. It's a thermal image of possums interacting with an older style AT220 and an A12 possum kill trap. So um, this is what happens when you just set and forget. You may put some food in your traps and and you walk away and you think right oh, job done uh so if you just play this video nick we'll just see what happens when we we're not there nighttime thermal imagery of this site uh over a period of weeks and months uh, and it records who turns up and what they do and the behavior of these animals so the, the square is around the, the possum that's turning up. Um, what Grant Ryan at Cacophony is doing is he's using AI to start um, identifying these critters. So a lot of this is about growing the, the identification of critters in these kind of imagery, but these are pretty much all possums. This is what happens at our sites when we're not there. And it's really important to, to know this because you might think you're getting nothing, but often that's not the case. So just to recap the stats there, there are these two devices were on this tree in an area that's had a lot of possum control for three months. There were 62 possums visited the site and there were no possums killed. So a cautionary tale that overused tools get blunt and as practitioners we need to be mindful of what happens when we're not there and not assume that because we're not catching anything uh, or there's no pile of carcasses at the bottom of these kill traps that there's no possums there. Um, Intel such as or high-tech thermal imagery but you can just use a trail camera or a chew card or, or other things it's really important that you understand what goes on when you're not there. And this next video uh, is another uh, good example. This is a stoat in the Kaimanawas around A24 traps that have been put out to protect the Figo population there. This trap was serviced 10 days prior to this with fresh bait, lured, lots of lays, lots of um, mutton fat, and this stoke's clearly attracted to the site, uh, picking up all the scent trails. 
but exit stage right. Mr. Stoke turned up at the device and had a good sniff around. Um, sorry. Um, and didn't get caught. We've got dozens of videos of Stoke's doing this at our A24 sites. Um, so a cautionary tale around just because you don't have anything dead at the base of your trap, uh, it doesn't mean there's no critters there. Um, let's move on to how cats interact with devices. This cat is about to walk past a modified Tim's trap. Uh, there's a live cage trap baited with fresh rabbit there. And in between the two, there's a leg hold trap buried in the road. And Nick, if you just play the video of this cat walking down the road past these freshly baited traps. You'll notice the date, August last year, freezing cold night, quarter to seven in the dark. Um, play it again, Nick. You'll notice he touches his paw on the cold steel of the leg hold trap and jumps over it and then licks his licks his paw. Um, this animal is really cued on to trappers. This image here is of the leg hold trap buried in the road. Um, he touched that. He dumped over it. Um, this cat is often around, looking into devices, sniffing around, eating possum carcasses at the base of AT220s. Um, very, very cunning animals. This is the same animal a week later. There's a nice piece of rabbit. He's sniffing the leg hold trap uh, and he wants the rabbit, but he's very, very aware that there's something not quite right. So he is avoiding the traps. This is an animal that's very, very wary, very cagey. And this is very typical of cats in particular, but this is this behavioral battle we're in. If we don't change our approach, we're not going to catch these critters. So um, if there's one statistic you take away from this presentation, I want you to take home this one. 80% of device encounters do not result in any pest interaction with that device. That That's a phenomenal uh, insight into pest behavior and how we as trappers have got to do stuff differently and stay really, really on top of the game to win this behavioral battle. There's no point in having kid out there that predators ignore. Otherwise, thousands and thousands of dollars, uh, millions of dollars of investment and labor, out hundreds and, or thousands of hours of time are going to be wasted. Um, just plonking kid out there and expecting it to work, especially if you're working in areas that have had a long history of predator control, um, you know, you can put all sorts of devices out there, but you, your attention to detail about how you do that will, will dictate your outcomes. Um, and, and I've put this uh, slide in because this is the Fjord and Wapiti Foundation team putting stoke boxes in the glacial valleys of Fjordland. Um, someone has supplied that timber free of charge. It's long lived um, H4 treated um timber those are kia proof traps with serious stainless steel mesh because kias are a bit of a nightmare in fjordland someone's built those boxes they weigh about nine or ten kilos each so these guys are really working hard to put them out in the field um, the helicopter companies that have donated their time to fly these traps into fjordland if these guys don't set every single one of those traps like their life depended on it every time then everybody's contribution all that all that effort is lost. So by not having an attention to detail on our trap lines, we're actually letting all our mates and all our sponsors and all our supporters down um, if predators turn up at these devices and just simply ignore them. So we we have to get better. And, and actually, there's a real psychology going on in the brains of animals when they turn up to a scene like this. Um, this cautious, inquisitive behavior. Our role as trappers is to change the psychology because what most of them see is this. They turn up and they go, yeah, nah, bro, I'm not going in there. Um, we have to turn that around to that. We have to have put a free giveaway in their letterbox. We have to have, they have to have a free discount voucher in their back pocket and a five-star endorsement on TripAdvisor on their phones when they're at the door of this trap which is encouraging them to go, hell yeah, bro, let me in. This is the psychology of trapping. And, and there are lots of ways we can do to turn that around. We don't want that 
because that's the caution winning for the pest. We want this because this is the inquisitive working for us. So that's where the attention to detail is so important. You've got to set every trap like your life depended on it. You've got to freshen up the trap side every time. Scuffing the ground, that creates interest. There's all those amphipods and that smell of leaf litter that you activate when you scuff the leaf litter outside your trap. Using pre-feeding and luring, you've got to have given them a free giveaway and they've got to be looking for you. Um, hazing and fencing, um, using local materials like logs and, and bits of moss or pungas to guide them off the game trails to the trap entrance, making sure the trap is clean and, and functions because the last thing you want is to have an animal go in there and have a misfire, which will hit the fear button. The fear button is what you do not want to ever push because that will make your job harder. And I'll show you a video in a, in a short time that emphasizes that. Um, We've got to change the baits regularly, and we'll talk about that as well, about following nature, following the patterns and rhythms of nature. We've got to make the site so exciting that our critters just can't wait to jump on our devices. The attention to detail, too, is about trap placement. Where we put these traps is really important. 20% of traps catch 80% of predators, more or less, and that's because predators aren't uniformly spread in the landscape. Um, we've got to use quality sets. We've got to make sure that what we do is razor sharp. It's not a race to who can check the trap line fastest. Predators are really efficient, so we've got to make it easy for them. All these things are, are going to change your outcomes when you're on your trap lines. The location um, is often about the features of the landscape. Linear features are what really matters to most of our predators. They like efficiency, so they'll run along roads and tracks and hedgerows and fence lines. Um, this is my fence line at home, leading from a large swamp um, up my boundary, uh, past the neighbor's broom thicket that's developed since the pine harvesting. Uh, I've mowed this bush line and I've put traps all along it. This is a highway from the swamp at the back of my property to my orchard, to my veggie garden, uh, where they all want to get food. So um, these linear features are what you want to target. Ferrets and cats don't like water either. So when you're working around waterways, targeting vehicle crossings or bridges or log crossings are, are going to be the ideal spot to, to make sure these critters are engaging with your devices. Avoid the cold, wet sites because often, yes, they might go there in February on a hot day to get a bit of air-conditioned respite from the heat, but most of the time they're not in these cold, wet sites. Hay barns are great for cats and ferrets because they have uh, rodents there to eat the seed and they're warm shelter spots for denning and, and breeding and stuff. The key thing here is if you have a trap on your trap line that's been through a whole season and hasn't caught, then you need to shift it. Um, you've got to monitor every trap on your spreadsheet and you've got to know that trap A17 catches every single time. It's a mean as ninja trap. But... S4 has never caught in the history of the project. So if that's the case, why is the trap still at S4? We need to shift it. And you might be surprised how short a distance you have to shift it. Five, 10 meters up onto a warm terrace in the sun might make all the difference to a trap capture. Trap location. Man, this is such an insightful uh, slide. If you rely on office-based uh, grids, then you're going to, miss the point that animals are not uniformly spread in the landscape. This is a bait take at a site that has bait stations at really high density across about a 500 hectare uh, location. There's been predator control here for a long time. And if, um, if you use a heat map to identify where the greatest bait takes are, this is incredibly insightful to tell you where animals are coming from in terms of reinvasion and where the hot spots are in this landscape for those that are surviving. So as you can see, um, there's a lot of devices in this setup which is not getting a lot of action. The analogy I use, if you wanted to control humans in New Zealand and you had a successful human trap, you wouldn't deploy it on a grid across New Zealand. You'd focus on Wellington and Auckland and State Highway 1. If you put one in the middle of Fiordland, you might catch a few hunters during the, the roar but the rest of the year, you wouldn't hardly get anybody. If you put one on the top of Mount Cook, you might catch the odd climber once in a blue moon. Um, you know, so 
so think about location, location, location. Um, you will learn about your project area over time, about which locations are good and which locations are less effective. And if you want to make sure that your trap sets and your bait station sets are razor sharp, you'll use the intel from your bait take and your trap catch to tell you where your hot spots are. I just want to also show you this trap and trigger map um, of the Nelson water supply catchment. This is where they've been getting goats uh, in the Nelson water supply catchment to control um, the goat population. And you'll see that goats are not evenly spread across the landscape. They love the limestone bluffs, which are those three particularly red areas. That's their favoured habitat. And there are another a number of other places where there are a few goats, but there's large areas of this area that don't have goats. So the, the take home message for the hunters here is that if you want to stay on top of the goat population, you need to target the hotspots. And it's the same for all of us in our community predator trapping programs. I want to show you this video now, and this is another Grant Ryan cacophony uh, video. And, and Grant was trying to determine what was the best way to detect the presence of critters in this pine forest. Was it a chew card, that brown peanut butter smeared cool flu on the tree in the middle there? Was it the trail camera on the right secured to the tree? Or what does thermal imaging camera detect more critters? What gave them the best index of pest or, or predator presence in this particular habitat? But what Grant found was something way different. Um, and I'm going to show you the video that came from this thermal imaging camera pointed on this chew card. A rat is running through the leaf litter in front of the thermal Im imaging camera. He's gone right past the chew card. Here comes a hedgehog. There's a rat. Uh, another rat. So the rat's quite active. A possum's just come past. And then another possum's just come past. Another rat. So suddenly... A rat finds the chew card and he goes, yum, peanut butter, yee-haw, I'm in. And over the next little while, there's a possum, it's just walked right past. But the rat comes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And what he's doing is he's laying a rodent scent trail, which smells of peanut butter. And suddenly the possum goes, hey, ratty's found something yum. Hey, it's a chew card full of peanut butter, yum, check this out. And so the rat's straight back into the chew card. Possum uh, hedgehog comes along. Hey, Raddy's found something yum. Let's have a look. Oh, it's peanut butter. Possum straight back to the chew card. So what's happening here is this peanut butter is attracting all of the critters in there to the scent trail of the rat that he's formulated going to and from the pre-feed. Um, so scent trails are really, really important to uh, increasing our engagement. And I'm about to show you another video here of a technique which has been deployed by Scottish gamekeepers in um, Britain for a very long time and trying to protect their grouse and their pheasants from things like mink uh, and, and ferrets and, and stoats. Um, Shirley is from Project Tongariro in Turangi here, and um, she's a bit of a conservation legend. She runs a large trap line on Mount Pihanga, and she had a 42 trap line that she's on in this photo. She hadn't caught a, a stoat for ages, and I suggested that she drags a dead stoat down her trap line to see what a difference that could make. And this video uh, is Shirley dragging a stoat down her um, trap line. This is the latest in stoat culture. Drag the stoat. Literally, a stoat on a piece of string dragged down the line, leaving a, a trail of scent smell in the forest along her trap line. Bit of a pain in a in a potter cut forest but um yeah this is a technique that's been deployed by um uh, gamekeepers for decades um, a week later shirley checked this line and caught four stoats on this line and she went from a bit of a cynic thinking i was yanking her chain to being a believer that that scent trails can make a difference what you can also do on the stoat is uh, get a fresh rabbit, open the rabbit up, and mush up the liver and the spleen, and open the paunch, and put the the paunch and the liver and the spleen in an onion bag, and tie that to the string with the stoat. And the scent trail that that sets up in the bush is that a stoat is chasing a wounded rabbit. And there's nothing more exciting for a stoat to think that one of his mates has got a free feed, and they'll want a piece of that. Um, 
So this is about training animals to do what you want to do, manipulating and modifying their behavior to cue them onto you so that they follow you. Bit of fresh rabbit in the Doc 200, boom, you know, you've sold them. Inqu inquisitive, high, caution, low. That's what we're after. Have you seen that um, question from Tabitha? Would a scent trail work with rats and possums? 100%. And we'll talk about that great question, Tabitha. And I think that's coming up. So if you want to increase your interaction rates on any device, and this is a more modern version of the AT220, um, and here's the setup. So there's a board, a rough sawn board leading up to a bait station full of pre-feed pellets and smooth blue. There's blaze, and the blaze is the standard flour, icing sugar, and for this one, cinnamon oil, because the smooth is a cinnamon product. And so that site there, if you shut that trap down for a couple of weeks, the pad runs that open up to this site are like a blue and white transmission gully highway. It's just phenomenal. Uh, because what they do is that the rats and the possums come here every day, day after day after day, and they get flour and cinnamon all over their whiskers, their hands, their fur. It's in their scats. It's on their breath. And they take that away. The, the scent trails that open up to this site going in all directions like a, a, a spoke on a wagon wheel uh, bring everybody in the, in the, with, for hundreds of meters of radius to the site. And you then open up this trap, boom, 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 boom. You've sold them. They're all coming to your restaurant. They're knocking on the door. Can't wait for you to open the door. Um, and this is, this is the strategy of training animals to do what you do. Um, seven to 10 days of pre-feeding, make it so exciting. And they endorsements from friends and family are the greatest way to get people engaging with your devices. I use a strategy called one third, one third, one third. Uh, of baiting. A third of the bait goes in the trap, a third of the bait goes on and around the immediate trap vicinity, and a third of the bait is in the landscape in a sort of 10, 20 metre radius of the site. So that, that, that site starts to shout in the landscape. It's not just sitting whispering in one little spot. It's actually got a, a sphere of influence for many, many metres all around it. Um, and I use this blaze liberally as I walk my trap lines, throwing it onto wet vegetation. It just cues everybody onto you and they start following you. And again, with the seasonal baits I'll talk about in a minute. Hey, Cam, uh, Nikki just asked why are boards used with the AT220s? She says she's had good success without the boards. Um, you just want to make it easy. Put the animal right onto the right part of the kill bar. Um, what you can find if animals are left to um, just interact with a device as they see fit, they'll stand on top and they'll run around. But if there's a board which is um, putting them, positioning them right in the perfect spot of the kill device, and I'll talk about this again in a minute, you're more likely to get a clean kill. You're more likely to get more kills. Um, so, yeah, I, I rate boards particularly for possums um, and of course, in our Kiwi forests, you've got to have your traps 700 mils off the ground um, as a minimum. So for wicker and Kiwi. So, yeah, um, if you're working on farm country, but you'll be surprised um, what a, a rough sawn wide board that's prefed like this will do for your kill rates. Cheers. Uh, these are the two products that um, can make quite a difference. The salmon lure is... Uh, incredible for ferrets and stoats um, and cats. They also make a rabbit lure. The salmon lure is pretty strong, so you don't want to overdo it. Uh, you can water it down with a bit of vegetable oil. Uh, I think it's $27 plus GSC and freight for a 500 ml bottle of the salmon lure. Um, so, yeah, use it sparingly and, and wisely, but very attractive. Omega oils are incredibly... Um, sought after by most of our predators. That's why they go for the brain of their kill when they've killed an animal. Often the first thing they go for is the brain and then all of the nutrition and the giblets before the protein becomes the energy source. So yeah, um, these are two very good products. Uh, and, and here's the making it easy thing. Uh, we've got the flipping tummy unboarded on the left. Um, yeah, and you've got the sentinel with a board on the right. And that smooth blue on the top, 
it just positions the animal in the perfect spot to get a nice clean kill when you're able to pre-feed the board um, make that trap site shout pretty loudly some of these traps uh, especially in Kiwi country where they've got to be well off the ground. You have to be Sir Possum Hillary to get in some of them, you know. You've got to get over Hillary's step to get in. And sometimes you'll catch them by the arm or they'll pull their, and they'll often pull their arm out. Um, so if you've got things like Tim's traps or flipping Timmies or Trapinators or Sentinels that have gone off and there's nothing in them, have a look for a bit of Possum fur. And it's often because he hasn't gone in the perfect spot for the kill to happen and you've caught him by the shoulder or the arm or something and he's pulled out so the board helps you position the animal as well as manage your non-targets making it easy we've probably all seen doc 200s like this um in my view there's absolutely no excuse to have a doc 200 looking like the one on the left um what's even more tragic in that doc 200 it had a golf ball for bait you know um I see a lot of golf balls in Doc 200s. I've never seen a stoat with a golf bag. Um, and and in fact, the stoat, on if he wanted to get into this one on the left, he would have needed a weed whacker in his golf bag. So it takes two minutes to turn the trap on the left into the trap on the right with all of that scuffed ground and interest. And you'll find that that trap will catch a thousand percent better than the one that's hidden in the grass with a golf ball that is just invisible to your critters. You know, we've got to be smarter about how we use these devices. The One of the biggest tragedies that I see in some community groups is that there's thousands of dollars worth of kits sitting, rotting, ineffective in the bush because people are have not got the right advice or the right understanding of how we make these things work really well. Um, this is a, a Doc 200 with a ramp leading up to the kill plate, but the key issue here is the sprags that are on the side. Um, yeah, you'll see that the bottom uh, entrance uh, mesh is folded to make a nice smooth, but the, the ones around the left-hand side, the top and the right-hand side are actually sticking quite sharp. Um, a sprag for an animal that squeezes in there is gonna push the fear button and he's never gonna come and engage with you at all. Um, you can see the rat chews on the, um, mutton fat and salmon oil uh, that's sprayed on the threshold of this particular trap. But I want to show you an amazing um, bit of trail camera footage now um, from a lady called Miranda Bennett at ARC in Auckland. And this is a ferret trap. And this is a ferret turning up to um, this trap. And a series of trail camera images. He, you'd think, yeah, we're going to get him. Yay. Pushes in, and, oh, nah, doubt it, bro, I'm out of here. Um, and that's the last you ever see of him. You know, there was an opportunity. Um, maybe the, the hole was too small. Maybe there were sprags on um, the, the mesh cut. Um, maybe he got spragged and got a, got a nip, but whatever, he didn't go in, you know, he was so close for us to kill this predator, so close, that's a missed opportunity. And that's where all this attention to detail, all this um, ninja predator trapping that we need to move towards, we're, we're not trap checkers, we actually have to be ninja predator hunters to really get the best out of all of this kit that's increasingly out in our environment. This is one of my sets, and I've highlighted the folded sprags, uh, well, the folded mesh cuts. Um, you can see the mutton fat rubbed all over the mesh. There's a piece of mutton fat at the door. There's a, um, a bit of rabbit oil sprayed in there. Um, there's flower lure uh, on the log. You know, this is, this is about avoiding the fright, making this really attractive. Um, same deal on my double set Victor boxes. The sprags are folded. The cool thing about these double set Victor boxes, they cost about $30 um, to make. They weigh less than a kilo, so you can carry 10 or 15 on your pack frame, no sweat. And if you bait them with a mixture of peanut butter or smooth blue and mutton fat, you'll catch stoats and rats. That's a big Norway rat in the bottom and a nice stoat in the top. Um, you know, but again, attention to detail, caution around the sprags. Um, yeah. And, just moving now on to 
um, the baiting thing, keeping it natural. This is a, a really cool possum paunch um, from an early June possum capture who had found a kahakatea tree and he had pigged out on ice cream. Uh, but interestingly enough, he went to the salad bar on his way home because, you know, we all know that you can't live by ice cream alone. You've got to get your greens. But, but this kind of intel helps you understand what possums are doing on your project area at a given time of the year, uh, at a given season, how they're using the landscape. This kakatea tree was obviously very popular, but he's filled up on clover and ryegrass in the pasture on his way home from the, the ice cream shop. Um, seasonal fruits are really important. Duck frames are fantastic during the duck shooting season from early May through uh, into June. There's a fair bit of crippling loss happens when a, a duck catches a, a stray pellet and, and dies 500 meters or 1,000 meters away and isn't recovered. Stoats, cats, ferrets are so cued on to duck frames in our estuaries and in our wetlands and along our river corridors during the duck shooting season. If you have uncles or dads or brothers or sisters or, or whoever who are hunting ducks and they breast their ducks, smash up their duck frames with a machete and freeze them into small bits and use duck frame in your traps around those scenarios and you'll find that your, your kill rates go hard out. I use eggs in spring, but only in spring. Um, eggs aren't in the landscape any other time. From September through January, there's eggs everywhere. Starling eggs, blackbird eggs, sparrow eggs at home, uh, pheasants and quail uh, in, in the wetlands, ducks and other waterfowl. Um, those are the times when eggs are part of the, um, the scenery, the, the natural diet. Um, but I always blow my eggs and I leave the omelette on the outside of the trap as the free giveaway. And the... And the um, blown egg is sitting horizontal on the nails in the trap. I, so many traps I see that eggs are sitting vertical, sitting on the nails, but eggs never occur in nature standing on their end. And if we want to have a, I mean, egg is a, a visual cue if there's no um, food associated with it, not hardly a scent trail, um, just a visual cue. Uh, if it's going to be a relevant visual cue, it needs to be sitting on its side as a, a stoat would see an egg sitting in a nest. But even better, if there's a bit of residual smell sitting in the egg shell and the omelette is laid in the scuff outside the trap, man, you'll be surprised how you increase it. Fresh rodent kills are amazing. And you can actually see in this trap, I've got a, a, a mouse trap at the back end of the trap because uh, I've got mutton fat on the nail above the egg there. And what I find is the mice come in and jump up and down and steal the mutton fat. But if you can put a wee mouse trap there, um, you can add a fresh mouse to your bait in your trap. So it's all these little things are, are seasonal and you need to follow nature. Uh, we, we've developed a calendar especially to help people understand the seasonality and the, the rhythms of nature that flow through a trapping project area that you need to tap into. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in the next couple of slides. But... It's all about this predator-free mindset. Um, you're not just a trap checker. If your outcome is to go and get a bit of exercise while you walk a trap line, that's probably the only outcome you'll get. If you just look in and go, oh yeah, nah, the stoat hasn't eaten the golf ball this trip again. Oh yeah, there's a bit of, bit of grass growing out there and he couldn't get in there anyway, but never mind, at least me and the dog are having a nice walk. Don't be a trap checker. We actually got to get that gamekeeper, predator, hunter, ninja sort of attitude going in our head with that attention to detail, with that inquisitive mind learning by doing, getting better and better and better. Which traps are catching? Which traps aren't? Why? Which baits are working best? What's in the landscape right now? Oh, yeah, this particular tree is on flowering. We need to mimic nature. Um, intuitive observation and connection to place is a critical part. Um, understanding things like weather influences. Everybody stays home during a cold suddenly while it's pouring with rain or snowing, but as soon as the weather clears, everybody's out for a feed. So, you know, if you can um, follow up a, a cold southerly with a trap refresh, man, you're going to be in a much better place. And then the use of local knowledge of people who are connected at place. Like there are... Um, Mana whenua around Aotearoa have been in these places for hundreds of years and they understand what goes on, what flowers when, what fruits when, when the eels come in, when the white bait runs. 
When, is, when are these things that guide predator behavior in our modern forests happening? That's what we have to tune into. And, um, and there is a, a lunar calendar in Te Ao Māori called the Maramataka, which um, I've gravitated towards over time because as a hunter, as a trapper, I've seen the influence of moon phase to uh, how my hunting and my trapping works or doesn't work. And so I'm a huge um, supporter and, and um, the, the maramataka, in my view, is something that we all need to get our head around a lot more. I've done a wee sort of graphic here, which is very crude, but it helps me as a, a hunter and a trapper understand the rhythms of nature and how they affect what what I do as a hunter and a trapper. And I'm sure this is these rhythms of nature are the, form the basis of the maramataka in the Māori lunar calendar. I don't profess to be a, a maramataka expert by any means, but... Um, the, the yellow line that flows through the seasons from Matariki through to Matariki each, uh, each winter, for me, is the breath of nature. Nature breathes in and nature breathes out. That's the breath of nature. And then for every breath, there's 12 heartbeats, which is the lunar phases from new moon to full moon to new moon. So these are the rhythms of nature, the annual breath and the, the monthly heartbeats. And, and Māori have a strong understanding of when things do stuff. Um, the Tangaroa moon phase in particular is this phase that comes about a week after the full moon. And it's a period where Māori were very active at eeling and fishing and hunting because it is a really, really efficient and productive time to do those activities. As a deer hunter and as a, as a predator trapper, man, the Tangaroa moon phase is the time that I have my traps as fresh and um, baited up as possible because that's when critters are most vulnerable and it, it's so real and, and I challenge people to start watching moon phase and weather patterns if you really want to see your trap catches go through the roof. So just putting it all together, this is a classic forest set of, of mine. This is a double set Doc 200. I've put a log along the side of the game trail. I've scuffed the game trail. I've put blaze on the tree not to attract predators but to attract hedgehogs and possums and stoats uh, and rats because their scent trails are going to attract ferrets and cats and stoats so the more critters you can get coming to your site setting up that that restaurant the more likely you're going to queue on your predators don't think about the next trap think about the trap after that and the set after that and the set after that this is a long game we want to queue your population onto this site um, if we just have a look inside the box, you can see the mutton fat above the, the kill plate. Um, mutton, flat, mutton fat is rubbed all over the baffles. Uh, mutton fat is flecked in the, in the scuff out on the game trail. Um, yes, you might catch a rat, but if you catch a rat in one of these double set Doc 200s, the chances of catching a stoat go through the roof. So, you know, the critical issue, I guess, is that sympathetic firing, you catch a stoat, or a rat in one trap and it triggers the other one to go off. So you've got to manage that. And there are a number of ways that we can do that. And um, the Seeker Foundation has just been working on that issue uh, in recent months. And we've got some pretty cool video footage that we'll put together to help people understand how to manage sympathetic firing a lot better. But these double sets catch six times more stoats than single sets. You think two traps should catch twice as many. Uh -uh. If you catch a rat or even better, a stoat in one of these traps, the chances of getting a stoat in the other one go up by six times. Um, Christine just said on that, what's the chance of catching robins using mutton fat as a lure? So if you've got a robin population and um, you have a whole lot of white like this, uh, you are going to attract robins because they're um, sight predators they see stuff and the bright white uh, and they'll pick up the mutton flecks um, so if you have robins in your project area you need to make sure that your mutton is only inside your box and maybe buried in your leaf litter around your box but not on the surface um, as I said in one of my early slides every tool has advantages disadvantages limitations and consequences and so non-target captures is a consequence of some of our tools. Kiwis, leg hole traps, there's been 
thousands of Kiwis maimed or killed in leg hole traps over the decades. Um, they're still a really important device in, in possum management in New Zealand, uh, but they kill a lot of Kiwis. So we've had to put in place mitigation to avoid that consequence. So if you have robins in your project area, be careful not to cue them onto mutton fat because I'm aware in Nelson area this year, they've had very, very high robin breeding and there's a lot of robins around and um, they've had some non-target kills uh, in these traps. Very good question. These tricks work across the board for all the tools, for all the critters, rats to cats, um, and they work very well for bait stations as well. Scuffing, blazing, pre-feeding, free giveaways, um, neon signs that say, welcome, come on in. Mm. Uh, we've got to modify and manage and manipulate pest behavior to do what we want them to do. And that's particularly important when you come to feral cats um, and ferrets because these guys are just devastating in our kiwi forests for our kia, for our fio. Um, if, if we want those treasures, we have to get real smart at these incredibly difficult, weary creatures. Um, ferrets love blood. Uh, the Doc 250 is a, a very good ferret trap. Um, this new one on the market is a SA4. It has a double spring. Um, it's showing a lot of promise. It only weighs about um, just over a kilo, um, and you can get them in the field for less than $140. So, um, you know, economics is a really important part. Um, and um, weight for those of us who do trapping in remote wilderness, um, you know, three or four Doc 200s, 250s on a backpack is, is a big load, whereas you can get probably 10 of these SA4s on a backpack. Feral cats, um, yeah, real real difficult as we saw early. This is one of my favorite Johnny Bissell photos of a cat looking at a ninja set. That's nothing wrong with that set, but that was the only picture of that cat. He never got caught. This is what we're up against, as you could see from those videos earlier. Um, yeah, these animals are not easy. They're often attracted to our devices by rodent kills at A24s or, or rodent kills in Doc 200s. They're quite hard to get into cage traps. Uh, if you're killing a lot of possums, um, as in the, this picture of a dead cat on the uh, right-hand side, you will attract a lot of cats to your dead possum, so you can bait these sets with possum to be quite effective on cats, but it's a long game. Often you'll know the animal is coming because your trail camera intel will be telling you who's about and you've got to watch their behavior, watch when they turn up and target them in a very specific way. Um, these new Tafferty smart cages are excellent. I've had one on my property for um, most of the season since October last year. Um, you can ninja them up. They are a run through trap. Uh, they're a multi-species trap. Ferrets, possums, cats. I've caught hawks and magpies and blackbirds, rats. Um, we've had a very, very wet uh, season in the Central North Island, so my muscle numbers have been virtually zero this year. But um, yeah, there's um, this is a fabulous device. It's got a z zip um, auto lure on the top, which drops a bit of mayonnaise on the central plate uh, every day. Um, really good device, and it's got an echo node that'll tell you when it's gone off um, if you put the base set up. So you can monitor your trap sets over coffee every morning to know which ones you've got to go and check and which ones you don't. So amazing piece of cool kit, um, very effective, uh, particularly when used set like this, um, ninja'd right up. Um, sometimes though, as we saw from that cat uh, in the videos, um, very, very difficult, uh, but use of dogs and firearms. Cats will tree if you push them pretty hard uh, with a dog. And so sometimes you've just got to change it up, use a different tool. Finally, I just want to touch quickly on mast years. Um, we seem to be having mast years more and more. They're the years where trees thrive and they produce huge amounts of fruit and seed and rodents boom. And, and this is just... Uh, again, a cautionary tale. You might feel good about seeing pictures like this, but trust me, what's dead there is not a drop in the ocean to what's still running around doing the damage to everything.
It's not how many tails you got hanging on the fence that's important. It's how many critters are out in the bush still alive doing the damage. So, um, you know, plagues of rodents. And from March onwards in a marsh year, rats will increase at about 1.1, 1.2% per day exponentially, quadrupling in about three or four months. So these populations respond very, very quickly to um, environmental cues like fruiting and, and seeding. And then, of course, once your rodent population expands because our predator populations rise on that, they're driven by that, then our predator populations expand. And that's the basis for why Doc goes for the nuclear weapons for their battle for the birds operations during mast years. So just to sum it up, uh, every tool can work and every tool can fail. Um, it's about understanding that every tool has advantages, limitations and consequences and mixing it up and not relying on the same tool over and over again. Um, we've got to change it up. We've got to often poison the trap shy ones or trap the poison shy ones. We've got to keep moving in the behavioral battle. We've got to understand that behavior to beat, um, beat our pests and, and win that battle. And that's why you've got to be a, a ninja predator hunter, not a trap checker. We've got to use that attention to detail, um, understanding the, the knowledge of place and the, the seasonal rhythms of place are really in, important. Weather influences, playing the long game. There's no shortcuts in predator management. If you try to do shortcuts, you'll fail. You've got to actually use your intel, your knowledge, your trail cameras, your observation, your spreadsheets to get better and better at what you do. And we will we will win the battle because we'll, we'll use our smarts to outsmart them. Doing nothing's not an option. Um, so, um, yeah, good luck. I hope there's been a few little gems in here which has helped. Um, and a lot of this stuff is on the Predator Free New Zealand Trust website. Uh, this video will go up there. And, yeah, if you have challenges or successes, please share them because um, this presentation is a synthesis of many, many people who, who have applied themselves to this kaupapa and that's what it's all about there's a kitty of knowledge that we have to share there's no ip and predator free we're all in this together thank you very much have you got any um tips on uh community groups um you know like what you've found people are doing to keep the fun in the game so that they're you know is there any tips you can give us on keeping those communities active and communicating and together from your time out and about? Yeah, I think one of the revelations for me in the last 18 months, two years, is um, trail camera video footage of devices. Just putting videos on devices and seeing what happens, who turns up, how they behave. Um, yeah, we've got a really good deal with uh, AJ Productions to um, get awesome discounts on some of the new Brownings that are on the market. They're really good quality cameras at a really sharp price. And Predator Free New Zealand Trust has got a really cool discount. Um, so putting trail cameras on devices and learning and sharing and showing people what happens when you're not there, it'll, it just transforms your understanding of, of what you do and how you do it. Um, and interrogating your trap lines, you know, get on Trap NZ and, and look at what's catching and what's not catching and when, uh, try and linking it to weather influences, try and follow those seasonal rhythms, those rhythms of nature. Look at the moon, be aware of where the moon phase is at all times and plan your trapping around that. Um, if you can freshen up all of your traps between the full moon and the Tongaroa moon phase about six days after the full moon, if you can make sure that all of your your traps are razor sharp in that little period, especially if you have a southerly blow through and then it comes right, um, critters are so active and so vulnerable during that particular Tongaroa moon phase. I think they're coming off the high energy full moon phase. They're a bit chilled, but they've um, yeah they just lower their guard a bit, and, and that inquisitive caution thing just swings into your favour at that time of year, at uh, that time of the month. Um, yeah, be more observant. Connect to your place. Connect to your ecology. Connect to the seasons. What's in flower? What's in fruit? What are the critters doing? How are they behaving around my traps? It'll just transform your interest 
and your success and the thrill of the kill is what gets people out there with passion, eh? I've um, got another one here. Uh, pretty straightforward question. How many metres of spacing between traps on a line? They are running between 100 and 200 metres. Uh, is this a one-size-fits-all or not really? Nah. Depends on your critter. If you ch if you want to suppress rats, you've got to close things right down because their home ranges are smaller. If you want to control possums, obviously, that they travel wider, so you can have a much bigger set. And, and to effectively target stoats, you know, you only need about six devices per square kilometre. Um, and cats, um, a 500 metre grid um, is potentially sufficient space to, to make a, a difference on, on cat control. So it's absolutely site specific and outcome specific. If you're trying to protect robins from rat predation, you'll need to close up your devices to sort of 75 by 75 or 100 by 50 or something similar to that. If you want to control possums, 100, 150 meter spacing grid is, is okay. As I said, for stoats, maybe six to 10 devices per square kilometer uh, and, and cats, bigger still. But target the locations that you're going to catch ferrets and cats and stoats and those linear landscapes, bridges, crossings. Stoats are great swimmers, so yeah, you don't need you don't need crossings for them. But yeah, again, it's understanding the ecology, connecting to place, connecting to the critter, connecting to the outcomes. Here's one. Uh, Sarah just um, asked, uh, how long is a reasonable length of time for an AT220 uh, if it's left to do its job once it's set without the need to go back and pre-feed blaze again? Yeah, I get really disappointed when I see manufacturers um, marketing traps as set and forget. Um, there's no such thing as a set and forget trap. Your first three or four weeks, you'll probably do okay. Um, you'll catch a lot of young ones and a lot of dumb ones. But over time, your trap will become less and less effective. Um, so I I would recommend that you service your AT220s um, maybe every four to six weeks. And A24s are the same if you're leaving them out for three to six months you're you're not going to catch many you'll do okay in the first three or four weeks um if you use the one third one third one third but if your trap's just sitting in the landscape whispering in a very small sphere of influence um yeah attracting critters to you to do what you want them to do is the key and shutting your traps down and setting up the interest is a really cool strategy. Don't be scared to turn your traps off if they've stopped catching. Set the communication channels back up again. Nelly's got a good one. Still getting used to dealing with dead carcasses. Any tips or tricks to get my brain around this one, please? Oh no, some some people use tongs and and you know scrapers to get um, hedgehog soup off their plates. Um, unfortunately, it's just a fact of life. If you check your traps once a month in summertime, usually you catch in the first two or three nights that you've been there when you've scuffed the ground and your bait's all fresh. And then when you come back um, three, four weeks later, you've just got a you've just got hedgehog soup in your box and you just can't do much about that except harden up, tough it up. <laughs> yeah, some find it easy and some find it hard. Maybe yeah. just Give a, an extra chocolate bar to the one that seems to really like it, I would imagine. Um, what does Omega Oil, uh, what's it good for catching again? Was it possums? Somebody asked? Everything. Everything. Uh, Everybody loves Omega Oils. It's, they're very um, limited in the landscape and in the diet, and your body can't manufacture them, so you've got to take them as part of your diet. Um, and the brain is full of them. So when a stoat kills a, a, a prey item, the first thing he does is eat the brain. That and, and ferret fanciers used to use um, linoleic oil um, to treat their ferrets when they are training them. It was the food reward for training ferrets. Um, so rabbit oil, salmon oil, um, um, th those are really sought after um, nutrients for all animals, rats, possums, stoats, cats, ferrets. Um, so that's why they're really attracted to rabbit and fish because those are rich in those omega oils. 
this question comes from Nikki, and it was just I'll try I'll just simplify it. Just said. Um, try to determine what predators I have on my small block with tube cards, and if I need a couple. Um, but right at the bottom, she basically says, um, just try to determine the best bang for the buck when buying traps on limited funds. Trail cam, she's put in the last sentence. Is that one of her best um, assets to find out what's, of course, on her little block? Okay, two, two things here. Uh, tube cards will tell you about mice, rodents, and possums. You might get a few real sharp hedgehog um, bites. You might be able to see hedgehog uh, needles, uh, but generally, yeah, they don't they don't tell you much about cats, ferrets, and stoats, um, or wallabies. Um, if you've got wallabies, what you can do is put um, a kilo of chopped carrot in front of a trail camera and see who turns up. Uh, but an even better one is to get a piece of fresh rabbit, a pit of, set of back wheels or something. Um, and put one of the rabbit legs uh, outside of a, a bit of wire mesh and the other wrap it in a wire mesh and tent peg it to the ground in front of your trail camera. And you'll get animals coming and taking away the first leg of rabbit and then coming back to your second leg of rabbit that they can't take away because it's pinned to the ground in a wire cage. And that will give you an incredible intel about just how many cats you've got on your block uh, you'll see interactions between ferrets and cats if they're there. Cats will beast a big ferret off a rabbit um, set like that. Um, always set your trail camera to 20-second video on fast trigger mode so that you, you it triggers quickly and takes video footage right from the start of the interaction, and then you get to watch 20 seconds of interaction of what's happening. If you just put it on um, photo mode, you'll just see a brown flash through and you go, oh, what was that? Maybe it was a stoat. Maybe it was a ferret. If you put it on um, um, rapid fire, you'll get a series of pictures like that ferret entering that trap I showed you before. The best insights come from watching video. And yeah, um, if you put a few chew cards out, that's fine. But try a few trail cameras and bait your trail cameras with carrots for things like wallabies, rats and possums uh, or meat baits for predators like rats and stoats and ferrets and cats. It's been great having you again, Cam Speedy. Uh, good luck to you. And thank you everybody for watching this part of the winter series here with Predator Free New Zealand Trust. We'll see you next time. I think the next one we've got is, um, uh, actually it's on August the 22nd, Innovations 1 to 2 p.m. with Helen Blackie and Olivia Rothwell. That'll be a fantastic one as well. Go cool. safe. See you later, Cam. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Nick. Kaki Bye-bye.